Hello and welcome to the Project Management Prepcast. I'm your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. The focus of this lesson is fundamental project finance principles for project cost management that are not necessarily discussed in the PMBOK guide. First, we answer the question, what are project finance principles? We describe a very broad definition that applies to all project managers and we present some of these basic finance principles. Next, we describe a more specialized use of the term project finance, followed by some real-world examples of large projects to help you understand the usage. After that, we discuss some of the financial investment models needed when making choices on projects and financing options. This includes the concept that projects are investments, tying up money, sometimes for extended periods. So we introduce and explain some theory on the time value of money, in particular present value, future value and net present value, followed by some comparative tools like payback periods, return on investment, benefits cost ratio and the internal rate of return. This sounds like a lot to cover because frankly it is. Uh, the good news is you don't really have to be able to calculate any of the formulas behind these concepts. Instead, you have to understand the concepts themselves and and make appropriate decisions on your projects based on that understanding. Yeah, there is so much information in this lesson, you might think you are becoming a junior accountant. However, we're only teaching you what you need to know to pass your certification exam. But it is enough information to break it up into three parts. Part one covers a high-level discussion of what finance principles are, along with some examples. In part two, we cover the time value of money. And in part three, we discuss some forward-looking tools such as the return on investment and the project manager's responsibility. We should get this show on the road. At first, project finance principles sounds quite intuitive. However, depending on your perspective, you might interpret the words project finance with drastically different meanings, and therefore the related principles would also be widely different. It's important to look at a general definition of project finance before diving into some of the specific tools in part two of this lesson. It's helpful to break the term down into its constituent terms. This may seem a bit elementary, but it's worthwhile. The first word is project. Projects, as we know from the PMBOK guide, are temporary endeavors undertaken in order to create a product, service or result. Finance, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, refers to the system that includes the circulation of money, the granting of credit, the making of investments and the provision of banking facilities. In general, it means dealing with money matters. And then a principle is a basic truth or theory. It is fundamentally a generalization that is accepted as true and can be used as a basis for reasoning or conduct. Well, what does it mean when we put it all together? Broadly, it means that project finance principles are the essential elements of the temporary use of money that you need to know as a project manager. Some examples may help. To grasp the meaning of financial principles, it helps to look at some of the core items that is prioritization, time value, risk and cash. One of the things that can spell the success or failure of an organization is its ability to properly prioritize and evaluate projects. How does an organization select and judge performance among different projects? There are numerous considerations, many of which are financial in nature. These include different ratios and calculations, such as the internal rate of return, return on investment, benefit cost ratio and payback period, which are used to prioritize and evaluate different project options. In addition, it includes the concept of the time value of money and the details of how to calculate the present value, net present value and future value. You should also have an understanding of the relationship of risk versus return. 
A basic financial tenet is that low risks are associated with low potential returns, while high risk is associated with high potential returns. The trade-off between risk and return is balancing the desire for the lowest possible risk and the highest possible return. You also should have a basic understanding and perhaps even respect for the importance of cash. As the saying goes, cash is king. Profit and cash are not synonymous. Companies need more than profit to be successful. They must also manage cash flow. They need cash for capital expenditures to cover unexpected costs. Often cash is the basis of growth. One duty of the project manager is to manage project cash flow as well as controlling project costs. For you as a project manager, it's important to note that these financial principles cut across the different knowledge areas of the PIMBOK guide. So you need to apply these financial principles in many areas of a project. Project cost management is an obvious one where you need understand planning, estimating, budgeting and controlling as well as monitoring of your costs. However, Finance goes beyond the cost side of the equation. In areas like benefits realization management and financing, you also need some understanding of cash flows and profit. You need to comprehend these concepts about the delivered product, service or result. Looking into the area of procurement, you need to provide recommendations or decisions on make versus buy or rent versus lease. Procurement also involves financial analysis and consideration of many different factors. As we know, the different areas of a project are interrelated, so thinking about where finance is involved, there are many overlaps between different project management knowledge areas. There is a financial aspect of schedule, thus the expression, time is money. Risk and rewards are intertwined with finance. Human resources usually account for a large percentage of expenses on a project. Stakeholders care about money matters too, and there is the need to talk and communicate about financial matters with project stakeholders. Earlier we discussed the definition of project finance principles and if you recall we used a very broad definition of the system that includes the circulation of money, the granting of credit, the making of investments and the provision of banking facilities. Hence, finance includes the granting of credit, the making of investments, the supplying of money or capital. In other words, as projects are investments, financing a project is one way of obtaining money or credit for your organization's investments. To make the definition even more specific, when a financial expert hears the term project finance, it is not the same as the term we just described of financing a project. Project finance is a specific type of financing technique or arrangement. We first talk about it in less technical terms. Project finance is a loan structure that relies primarily on the project's cash flow for repayment. In layperson's terms, you are able to borrow money based on potential cash flow that may arise from the project. In these type of arrangements, the project's assets, rights and interests are typically held as collateral or secondary security, where collateral means something is pledged as security for repayment of a loan, which can be forfeited in the event of a default. And default is when someone cannot follow through with a contract. In this context, they cannot repay the loan. Another way of saying this is that when a debtor is un able to make a repayment according to the contract terms, the debtor is required to give up ownership of an asset or cash flows from an asset as compensation for the resulting losses of the lender. Project financing is typically used in long-term infrastructure such as sewage, water and electric systems. It is also used in high-cost investments, such as constructing sports and entertainment venues. Project financing is also typically used for industrial projects, such as mining and public service-related projects like telecommunications and transportation, all very expensive. 
Vehicles, a finance term for methods for financing projects, can come from one or more sources. These include debt, like bank loans or bonds, equity, including investors, cash, and, and more. For example, when a new bridge, road, or airport is built, the project is financed based on the tolls, fees, and other revenue that will be collected usually after the project is complete. This type of project finance is used in many different countries and a variety of industries. We have some specific examples for you in a bit. Here's another way to look at project finance. In general, companies rely on a financial infrastructure to finance their operations using a specific mix of long-term debt and equity. You may already be familiar with these two terms. However, here's a quick differentiation. Debt is an amount of money borrowed by one party from another, whereas equity is the value of the stock shares issued by a company. Lending institutions typically provide loans to fund projects, while equity investors or sponsors typically provide cash funding. A special purpose entity or special purpose vehicle is a legal entity created for the purposes of just the project. It has no assets other than the project itself. This arrangement protects the project sponsor's assets in case of project failure. Furthermore, project finance can be in the form of non-recourse, limited recourse funding, or both. Before we get into these types of loans, we should understand what recourse even means. Recourse provides some protection to lenders. Recourse is a legal right to demand compensation or payment. A non-recourse loan is the most common type of loan structure for project finance. Non-recourse essentially means that the loan is secured or backed by some form of collateral. Residential mortgages or loans against the house in which you live are examples of non-recourse loans, where the house or property serves as collateral. In the project finance context, it means that, as we mentioned earlier, it is the assets, rights and interests of the project which are considered as collateral. In contrast, a recourse loan, that is where a lender would still have rights to go after any collateral. In addition, if money is still owed after the collateral is seized and sold, the lender can then go after the borrower's other assets or sue for compensation. Project finance does not usually utilize recourse loans as this presents a higher risk to the borrower. Project finance can also consist of limited recourse loans. This is a type of debt that is somewhere between a secured and unsecured loan. To distinguish between the two, secured loans are based on some form of collateral, whereas unsecured loans are usually issued and supported by the borrower's credit worthiness alone, rather than being backed by collateral. Typically, a significant milestone event or achieving a set condition, such as the completion of the project or when the positive revenue stream is established, is when a limited recourse loan converts to a non-recourse debt. Here are a couple of examples. Highway 407 is a tolled highway in Canada. According to Wikipedia, it is the world's first all-electronic toll road. The province of Ontario provided 500 million Canadian dollars funding to build the initial segment of Highway 407 with long-term debt. It was later decided that the private sector should have a role in the highway's future operation and financing. The present highway is owned by 407 ETR Concession Company Limited, which is officially known as the 407 Express Toll Route or 407 ETR. At the time, it represented presented the largest privatization in Canada. It is operated privately under a 99-year lease agreement with the provincial government. 
The completed project at 4 billion Canadian dollars was financed in part by a mix of non-recourse loans and equity. Specifically, it was financed with 2.3 billion as a senior bridge credit facility and 150 million as a junior bridge credit facility. 775 million were a sponsor's subordinated credit facility and another 775 million came from sponsors. Equity. Highway 407 was built in the late 90s to the early 2000s. The highway is being extended and these extensions will likely be publicly owned. The second example of project finance is the ICTIS Liquefied Natural Gas Project, the ICTIS LNG Project in Australia. This is a project in northern Australia and according to their website, the ICTIS LNG Project is effectively three mega projects rolled into one, involving some of the largest offshore facilities in the industries, a state-of-the-art onshore processing facility and an 889 kilometer long pipeline, uniting them for an operational life of at least 40 years. The 48.1 billion US dollar project is heavily backed by Japanese energy companies with a debt package of 20 billion and an equity stake of 28.1 billion. To tie this back to what we have discussed about project finance, the Australian government and other investors, they created a special purpose entity whose billions of dollars of debt is dependent on the 40 years of cash flow that is expected to be generated. Another relatively common use of project finance is for airport expansions or improvements. As passenger traffic flows through airports, there is business to be had from food and beverage concessions, advertising and other passenger services. For example, the expansions at London City Airport were funded through project finance and the government of India. They have developed new airports or modernized existing airports in many cities on a public-private partnership basis. But financing is not just roads, oil and gas and airport projects. Project finance is everywhere. In setting up Disneyland Paris, the Disney company set it up as a project structure rather than the corporation owning it outright. But although project finance is becoming more popular, not all large projects are financed this way. Looking up on Wikipedia, topping the list for most expensive public works project at 14.6 billion is Boston's Big Dig, whose official name is the Central Artery Tunnel Project. The project was municipally financed and not project financed. An important point to note is that these large projects, whether project financed or not, do carry huge risks. Many large projects, Euro Disney for example, have had their share of financial woes. Project delays are quite common. Project finance is not an easy path. Specifically, project finance projects have very large transaction costs. They take a long time to negotiate and close. As you can imagine, the contracts and organizational structures that enable these projects can be extremely complex. Well, that wraps up part one of the lesson here on project finance principles. Here are some takeaways for you. Project finance principles include many different forms of financing, including bank loans, cash, bonds, partnerships, equity, and the like. Financing options are nearly unlimited, as the tools are only limited by your imagination and legal constraints. There is nearly always a tie to some form of collateral, and it can reach beyond the scope of the project. Well, I look forward to you joining us for another lesson soon. Maybe part two of Project Finance Principles? Until next time.